From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. We start in Ecuador, where students protest in Quito against massive cuts to public education budget. Higher education will see a budget reduction of 145 million U.S. dollars. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, brings us this report. The Faculty of Jurisprudence at the Central University of Ecuador was the meeting point for hundreds of peaceful and organized students to express a clear message to the President Lenin Moreno no cuts to public and private education in the country. We are gathered here against the budget cut that the current government wants to make to the public and private universities. We are against the cut of $145 million to Ecuadorian education. Ecuadorian students from both public and private universities have said that are extremely concerned about the general budget for 2019. The budget was reduced by 10% since the previous year, the students are demanding that funding be returned to higher education institutions and say that it is necessary to increase the budget and to expand access to the higher education system. Today the students have decided to take over the public spaces of our city in order to demand that the government think this over well. They better not mess with education. Ecuadorian citizen, the students will be organizing marches around the country. This is a government that is against the people. What we're seeing now is cuts in public spending on education and health. That's what we're experiencing. This is outrageous because they are prioritizing the needs of the economic elite and not the needs of the people. The peaceful protest was held all throughout the main streets of the historic center in Quito. They marched toward to the presidential palace with intention to meet President Lenin Moreno, but they were blocked by police. The police has always been the tool of oppression towards the people. Today, for example, we can see that they didn't allow us to enter. Those in uniforms also have children studying and yet they still defend the oppressor. The students are also proposing a discussion table which will include all sectors of higher education to discuss the budget. They warn that this is just the first mobilization of several that will be held around the country against the budget cut proposed by the Minister of Economy and Finance, Richard Martinez. Denise Herrera, Del Sur, Ecuador. Moving on to Mexico, a group of about 800 migrants have set out from Mexicali towards Tijuana to join the caravan already at the border. While many in Mexicali were able to find room inside shelters, others were not so lucky. They say that they are going to Tijuana in hopes of finding shelter while waiting on their asylum request. The group you see here is planning to go to Tijuana to see if they can accommodate us or to see if we can get by over there. The truth is that we are a large crowd and we want to see how we can head to Tijuana, even if we can get rice or at least get on the back of trucks or maybe catch a bus and go bit by bit and see how we can help anyone who couldn't make it. The truth is that there is no room for us here in Mexicali. The idea of the caravan was for all of us to stay together since the day we set out. They say that the meeting point will be Tijuana, not Mexicali. We are here because the shelters over in Tijuana are full. Mexican police stopped hundreds of anti-immigrant protesters from reaching a migrant shelter in the city of Tijuana. A number of residents had previously protested the migrants' arrival at the border city. They shouted no to the invasion in reference to the caravans. anti Tijuana's mayor, Juan Manuel Gastelum, has asked the Mexican government for resources to accommodate the migrants. In a radio interview, the mayor said that they need police reinforcements plus 100 million pesos in funding to provide aid to migrants. He also stated that he finds it hard to believe that nobody is paying the migrants to make it trek north. Our correspondent Pablo Perez brings us more from the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Well, we are now in downtown Tijuana, this uh, multicultural and diverse border town between Mexico and the United States. And, well, we have seen so many different things happening in this la la last few days. And, well, uh, contrasting with the violence that was uh, that uh, visually present yesterday by a small group of radical extremists that uh, express themselves with uh, racism and, and, and uh, xenophobic slurs uh, uh, directed towards the migrant community. Well, today there was a meeting of, uh, 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 of different uh, non-social and civilian organizations and also different churches that not only from here from Tijuana but also from the other side of the border coming down from uh, San Diego and Los Angeles to show their solidarity and to uh, to uh, praise the effort made by the migrant community of the uh, migrant caravan. So we have the two different point of views in the same city, in the same area, and it seems that the people that wants uh, to respect the human rights of the of the Central American migrants is uh, is more present today than it was yesterday, and they are calling. Uh, to the calling the, all the citizenship to action to uh, show them that the people in Tijuana is not against mi migrants and it's, uh, this is so something very coherent with the nature of this city where it's, uh, it's uh, calculated that uh, over 60% of the population comes from another state in Mexico or another country. And after being temporarily closed down overnight the border crossing of San Isidro has been reopened. Authorities say the crossing was closed to beef up security with around 100 soldiers installing barbed wire along the crossing. But despite these measures by the U.S. government, new groups continue making the difficult journey north as part of the Central American exodus. From early morning, 300 people gathered at the Divino Salvador del Mundo Square to begin the dangerous journey towards the United States. Their primary reason for leaving their country are the lack of opportunities and the high level of violence. What has us leaving our country, the nation where we were born and raised, is the fact that there is no work, there is a lot of poverty, and a love of crime. So we are willing to take this risk in order to give our families a better future. Marina Gare travels with two of her children. Her husband disappeared two months ago and she has looked for him at hospitals, jails and funeral homes. She says that her family has been threatened and therefore she has decided to migrate. She wants to send a message to the U.S. President Donald Trump. Since my family was threatened, we left our house and we have been staying with our neighbors. While we wait to begin our journey, I want to tell U.S. President Donald Trump to have mercy on Salvadorian families who are suffering. This fourth caravan will go to the bus terminal where they will board several buses to head towards the Guatemalan border. Social organizations have said that this will be a new form of migration. From now on they will migrate in large size caravans and groups because of criminal extortion and the high individual fees for the coyotes and narcos. We are now reaching $50,000 to be taken from El Salvador to Honduras, to Guatemala, in order to get to the United States. According to this group of migrants, traveling in a caravan may prevent criminal organizations from making money by exploiting people. They say they feel more secure as part of a large group. This, despite the various government institutions which are trying to convince them to abandon their difficult journey. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. This just in, Ali Rodriguez Araque, former Venezuelan minister, lawyer, diplomat, and friend to Hugo Chavez, has died in Havana. 
Rodríguez Araque served in various positions under President Chávez and President Maduro in, in Venezuela. He was known for being a dedicated public servant and a socialist who also held the position of Secretary General of UNASUR. He was 81 years old. Brazil's lower house is set to debate once again the controversial school without a party bill, a proposed law that will suppress what the far right calls the indoctrination of students at schools. Analysis and voting on the school without a party bill is returning to the lower house on November 20th. Meanwhile, educator unions, student movements, and even judges of the Supreme Court are showing the rejection of the bill. We are here at this resistance camp where we have always defended public and secular education. We fight for democratic and socially diverse schools. That's what Brazilian teachers are fighting for. This new bill is considered to be unconstitutional. It's a bill that bans not only sexual education and reflections on gender, it censors teaching with a campaign against the school's supposed indoctrination. This has led to harassment and death threats against teachers who only want to exercise their right to teach. This is a very subjective matter because if one history teacher wants to bring out a subject like African religions, then when a Christian religious student goes back home after class and talks about that subject, that teacher can be prosecuted and criminalized. The same example can happen if a biology teacher dares to bring out Darwin's evolution theory that opposes the creationist theory. So what people actually are defending is a universal education that adheres to scientific facts. According to the law, teachers won't be able to address current subjects like social inequality, racism, and hate crimes against sexual diverse communities in their classrooms. This is a fallacy that suffocates education efforts. People should be able to have different opinions without being criminalized, and they should also be able to share them. We should be able to teach future citizens how to defend their own opinions without being manipulated by other ones. Deputy Eduardo Bolsonaro predicts that next year, the Congress will be even more conservative, and therefore it will be even easier to approve laws like this one, with the far-right parliament members in the House. Danay Galetti Hernández, Telesur, Brasilia. Almost 3,000 people have been evacuated in Guatemala after the Fuego volcano erupted again. Authorities declared a red alert as security forces closed roads and helped with the evacuations. In June of this year, the Fuego volcano erupted, killing more than 300 people. Our correspondent in Guatemala, Santiago Botón, brings us more. A red alert has been issued in the municipality of Escuintla for a new eruption of the Fuego Volcano. Several rescue operation teams are working together to evacuate many families living near the volcano, which killed many people in June 2018. Rescue teams announced that 500 people have been evacuated already and say they are working on moving 2,000 people to Escuintla's stadium. Last night, local authorities of the Zacatepec and Squintla departments held a meeting to coordinate evacuation procedures along with community authorities. A week ahead of the G20, G20 meeting in Argentina, former Latin American leaders Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, Dilma Rousseff and Jose Mujica are leading the first worldwide forum on critical thinking. The theme of the event is fighting for equality, social justice and democracy. World leaders, intellectuals and activists have gathered for the four-day meeting to discuss social issues affecting the region. Former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff addressed concerns about Lula da Silva's imprisonment. Using a so-called anti-terrorist law, which will criminalize the social movements. And if you express solidarity with them, you will be criminalized as well. These legal measures is a process of radicalizing what was already happening. And this will attack the most important social movements, political, the progressive, progressive political parties, left political parties, or even anybody who diverges, dissents. Because I think we're taking a pace beyond, beyond the previous stage. That's why we need a, a popular and democratic front. That's why 
todos we have to aqueles que vão combater o autoritarismo want to fight e essas medidas. Also speaking at Claxo, the former Argentine president Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner spoke about the devastating effects of neoliberal policies in Argentina. This is the result of the return of neoliberalism. We could talk about the situation of pensioners, about the situation of unemployment. When we finished our government in 2015, it was 5.9%. And now, it's certainly in two figures, and it's grown after the elimination of thousands and thousands of jobs, what we all know. After the murder of Mapuche activist Camilo Cartillanca in Chile's Araucanira region by the national police, more and more voices are calling for the resignation of Interior Minister Andrés Chadwick. Let's find out more in this report. Protesters arrived to La Moneda Palace to urge the government political responsibility on the interior minister Andrés Chadwick, but what they found was more repression. The Mapuche people continue suffering in state terrorism. It is estimated that 16 young Mapuche have been killed during this democratic period. Every government, right-wing, left-wing, socialists, communists, all have said the same. They'll try to return the lands, but I don't believe them. They continue to torture young people and mistreat our children. In social media, the hashtag Renuncia Chadwick, Spanish for Resign Chadwick, has been trending topic worldwide. Why there is this massive deployment of security forces in the Araucanía? You say there is no ethnic bias, but there are over 300 special forces deployed. How would you explain that? You are saying things that are wrong. There are not 300 special forces agents deployed, so I ask you to be objective. Could you tell us the number then? Yes. The first group arrived with five agents at the place where Camilo Catrilanca's unfortunate murder took place. There were five police agents. A Mapuche comrade has been hurt, and police continues shooting the community. There are two helicopters around, and at least more than 400 officials in the community. There you can see one helicopter flying, shooting. The explanation given by the interior minister makes it even worse. It looks like the government is defending this crime, and that is very worrying. And that's why we go to Walmapu. If you could travel as the Telesur team, we would be really thankful so you are able to cover and spread the truth of how things happened in Chantul Mai. It is a matter to get to know the truth on a case that has put Chile under the eye of the world. People in Peru are protesting outside the Uruguayan ambassador's home in Lima after former President Alan Garcia applied for asylum in Uruguay. Demonstrators protested in support and against the former president. Garcia is under investigation for allegedly receiving bribes from Brazilian construction company Odebrecht during the construction of Lima's subway system. Our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, has the latest on the case. Former President Alan Garcia is staying at the Uruguayan ambassador's home for the second day in a row. He went there to apply for political asylum and is now waiting the response on this request. This after a judge in Lima ordered that he not be allowed to leave the country for 18 months following the Attorney General's office investigation into Garcia for money laundering and corruption. The former president's lawyer said they decided to ask for asylum after they heard rumors that the Attorney General's office would ask for preventive detention for Garcia. Protests have been taking place outside the Uruguayan ambassador's home in Lima and more protests are expected today. Meanwhile, Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra has said there is no political persecution in Peru and that all citizens should answer to the law. Meanwhile, local media outlets have started reporting on this story using headlines such as Fugitive Flees Justice and He Escapes for the Second Time. Colombia's public prosecutor has found a cyanide bottle in the house of a key witness in the Odebrecht case who died last week. Jorge Enrique Pisano passed away from a heart attack three days before his son died poisoned. Before passing away, Pisano revealed in an interview that the general attorney 
knew about the bribes involving the construction company Odebrecht. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that violence against women is a human rights issue that has huge consequences for society. Speaking at an event to address violence against women, Guterres said that this issue is a manifestation of failure by men to recognize the inherent equality and dignity of women. The violence can take many forms, from domestic violence to trafficking, from sexual violence in conflict to child marriage, genital mutilation and femicide. It is an issue that arms the individual, but also has far-reaching consequences for families and for the society. The United Nations Third Committee General Assembly has voted for the recognition of the rights of campesinos. 119 countries voted in favor on the resolution that campesino organizations have been campaigning on for many years. Only seven voted against it. The Third Committee is tasked by the General Assembly to deliberate on issues relating to social, humanitarian affairs and human rights. And now let's take a look at some other stories making headlines from around the world. At least 25 Palestinians have been injured by Israeli forces using tear gas during a rally in the Gaza Strip. Palestinians gathered in support of the flotilla Freedom Ship 16 that set sail from the port of Gaza to try and break the Israeli siege. Rocks were then thrown at the fans leading to the Israelis firing tear gas. Those wounded and suffering from tear gas inhalation were rushed to the hospital. The siege of Gaza by land, sea and air began by Israel and Egypt in 2007 after the electoral victory of Hamas. A political opposition leader in Azerbaijan has been released from custody and ordered to pay a 1,500 US dollar fine for organizing a memorial march. Ari Karim Lee of the Popular Front Party was arrested during the march on Saturday in remembrance of those killed during the country's secession from the Soviet Union. After his release, he vowed to continue rallying in memory of those who died. Our action was legitimate. Actually, the way those who tried to stop us act was illegal. Most importantly, we uncovered a try to plan with our persistence. They want to shut down Martyrs Avenue to the people. The Sri Lankan president has apologized to Buddhist monks after authorities used tear gas and water cannons against them as they gathered to demand the release of the Secretary General of Bodubala Sena, a nationalist organization. They had gathered to protest against the imprisonment of the Secretary General and demanding an audience with the President to hand over a written request for his release. The President has promised an investigation into the incident. And we come to the end of this news brief. This and many other stories you can find on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching. An occasion to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines